Hello, and welcome to part four of the new tutor training videos from LearningWorks' English Language and Literacy program. Part four is basic literacy and reading strategies. In this lesson, you'll learn about the four components of literacy, which don't just include reading and writing. You'll get an overview of the literacy curriculum materials that we have used with great success to teach many adult students how to read for the first time. You'll strengthen your understanding of reading fundamentals, which can be applied to working with students of any level. And you'll also learn some general, very helpful strategies for helping students become more proficient readers. Before we begin, let's look at some general context about literacy, both in the United States and within the English Language and Literacy Program at LearningWorks. According to proliteracy.org, in the United States, there are more than 36 million adults who cannot read, write, or do basic math above a third grade level. As mentioned in a previous video in this presentation, the origins of the English Language and Literacy Program were in helping many adults who were native-born English speakers improve their literacy skills. But looking at the English language learner population, of the roughly 2 million immigrants who come to the U.S. each year, about 50% of them lack a high school education and proficient English language skills. So of the students who we see who are of the immigrant, refugee, and asylum seeker population, lacking literacy skills is a common um, challenge in this population. And let's look at how that breaks down a little bit more in detail. According to proliteracy.org, in the United States, in the English Language and Literacy Program, we assess student level at the time of the student's intake. We ask them about their prior education, we gather writing samples, we assess their oral language, and we ask about their ability to or experience in reading and writing in their home language as well as English. And looking at the pie chart here on the left, the categories of student hi highlighted include those who identify as being at the basic literacy level. So these are students who can't quite write either their name or um, just some simple words using the Roman alphabet or who have never formally studied uh, reading and writing, uh, including that in their own language as well as English. Um, but we've also highlighted low beginners and high beginners. These three parts of the pie chart represent students who most likely are struggling in some capacity with the skills of reading and writing. And when we look at the prior education of students in our program, the highlighted sections here also represent the nature of student who is most likely to lack fundamental reading and writing skills. So obviously students who never went to school will very likely struggle with literacy or be at the very basic literacy level, but even students who have some elementary, middle, or high school might struggle with basic reading and writing. When we say literacy, or when we describe students as struggling with literacy, what do we mean? When you hear the term literacy, you might think of only the skills of reading or writing, as it's commonly referred to. But there are actually four components of literacy that are all interconnected. These components include the input skills of listening and reading and the output skills of speaking and writing. So by input, we mean a more passive skill set. You can just intake information either by listening or reading without having to actively produce anything in the process. On the other hand, output means you do have to produce something. You have to fit words together orally. You have to produce them on a page in the written form. Generally, output skills are more difficult for many students. A lot of students who say they can listen and understand or might be able to read words on a page really struggle with speaking and writing. How might speaking and listening come into play for the act of reading and writing? All language skills are interconnected. By strengthening one, you're actually strengthening all of them. The more a student listens to how language sounds, the better they'll be able to speak and reproduce those sounds or those language rules and patterns. The more a student understands listening and speaking, 
the better able they will be to recognize the written word, understand rules of sounds, phonics, and spelling, and then finally, using all those skills, produce writing, which is often considered the most challenging language acquisition output task. So in the course of helping someone improve their reading or writing, it's very likely that you'll also be doing some listening and speaking skills. These include things like dictation, so asking a student to write down what it is they hear, and other things that strengthen multiple skills at one time with the general goal of increasing a student's reading and writing ability. What are the basic skills involved in reading? These fundamental reading skills include decoding, vocabulary, fluency, and comprehension. It's important to note the difference here between decoding and comprehension. Decoding simply means that a student has figured out or has come to understand the rules of phonics. What are the sounds made by the letters of English? The student might be able to read whole passages very correctly, but they might not be comprehending, really understanding the meaning, the context, or any of those underlying parts of the written word, even though they've developed the important first skill of knowing how the words sound at all. Vocabulary, obviously, is an important reading skill. The more words you know and acquire, the more you'll see them and recognize them and have an easier time of reading them in context. And fluency is another important skill. Fluency is the ability to string words together and get the bigger picture without struggling to separate and understand one word at a time. Now that we understand the basic definition and components of literacy, we're going to talk for a little while about one of the best methods we've used over the years to help new readers gain those skills. It's called the Lawback Way to Reading, and while it's not required for every tutor-student pair, and it may not be relevant for the level or goals of the student that you end up working with, it's extremely helpful for students who have perhaps never learned to read or had much formal education. You're welcome to skip this part and go on to the more general reading fundamental skills and strategies a little later in this presentation, but if you end up being matched with a student who is at a basic literacy level, it might be helpful to come back and review this part of the presentation. The Lawback Way to Reading curriculum series was originally published in 1970. It's a four-level, time-tested method that has taught millions of adults to read. It's ideal for adult learners who have little or no reading skills, most likely due to zero or limited prior education. It's a step-by-step, -step, highly structured method that works really well for some students. Let's take a look at how it works. This is the first phonics chart in the first lesson of the very first book of the Lawback series. You'll notice that only a handful of consonant sounds are presented here. Generally, consonants are easier for new readers to learn and practice than vowels, which do come a little bit later in the series. The reason for that is something called auditory discrimination. New English speakers or learners might not have developed a very large sense of auditory discrimination yet, meaning they can't understand the difference between all the sounds they're hearing in English. There are about 15 vowel sound variants in English, which is around twice as much as most other languages. Because of this wide array of how vowels can be sounded out and spelled and how they change depending on their placement in a word, for new readers, it's easiest to start with short lists of consonant sounds, which are easier to discern. So let's take a look at the consonant sounds presented here and the way that the lawback method works. Here, the tutor will point to the first picture on the first row and say the word of whatever that is. So the tutor will point to the picture of the bird and say bird. The tutor will then point to the picture of the letter B, say the letter's name, B, and importantly, the sound the letter makes. Here it's B. In the third column, the tutor will point to the word bird. The tutor will say bird and then B and then B. Finally, in the fourth column, the tutor will point to the first B and say the name of the letter, then point to the second B and say the sound. 
So it'll sound a little something like this. Bird, B, B. Bird, B, B. B, B. It may sound a little silly at first, but the extremely incremental repetitive nature is very accessible for new readers. This sequence is repeated for all rows, and a tutor can repeat it six to eight times along with the student as they're starting out getting a handle on what words and sounds, letters, and names of letters look like. Um, some tutors have successfully used tracing methods with students, and by tracing the shapes of the letters which are overlaid on their associated pictures, the student starts to be able to recognize the shapes of letters and to associate them with the correct sound. In the Lawback series, each phonics chart is accompanied by a story, or at least a piece of text, that can help the student start to put the letters, sounds, and words they've just practiced through the repetitive phonics chart into context. Take a moment to read through the reading process for story one, the girl. As you can see from the jump from book one to book two, the scope of the curriculum of the Lawback series is as follows. Book one has extremely repetitive, simple uh, structures to the sentences and the stories. Book two has a greater volume of text, more focus on vocabulary and character, and it only progresses in complexity and volume from there. By the time a student has reached book three or four, they may need some supplementary texts because at this point they are becoming proficient readers. But the Lawback series is still well-structured enough to provide even more advanced readers with the repetition and structure and learning format to continue building their skill. The Lawback series is available for borrowing or copying at LearningWorks. There are workbooks, extra phonics practice, and teacher's guides also available. Online has additional resources, so let us know if you're interested in using any of the Lawback materials to help your student. The methods listed in this presentation are also to be found in each edition of each volume of the Lawback series, as well as the teacher's guides. Let's take a moment to talk more about reading fundamentals in general. So these are the skills beyond basic literacy that will help students make the leap from decoding to truly comprehending and even enjoying reading. A couple notes before we get started. The purpose and end goal of reading is always comprehension. It can be a tempting path for either a student or a tutor to really focus on decoding to endlessly repeat the drills and to feel satisfied when a student has really mastered a sound or a phonics rule. And while that's certainly important, it's good not to just stop there, but to continue toward the path to comprehension. It's important to remember also that this takes years of practice. If you've grown up reading or learned to read at a very early age, it might be difficult to remember that for adults, this might take a very long time. And this has to do with the idea of neuroplasticity or the ability of the brain to create new pathways and patterns and retain new information. It gets harder as we get older. That doesn't mean it's impossible, but it will take a lot of time and practice as well as patience to reach those same goals that may have been easier as a younger learner. What are the key reading skills you will need to help your student develop? Comprehension, as mentioned before, is important. Understanding what the text is about. Context. What does this story mean in regards to the student's actual life? What's commonly known as their lived experience or prior knowledge? Can the student really understand the context of the story and maybe relate it to things they already know or understand? Interpretation. So this is what's known as filling in gaps, using clues or evidence from the text to analyze problems or maybe draw conclusions. 
Synthesis, which is one of the higher level reading skills, involves reading beyond the lines, not just between them. Students might remember something they've read before, something that came up in another part of their learning, and do some drawing in of those other sources and times to make what they're reading now really expand. And evaluation. If someone, if a reader is able to express their opinion, ask questions, maybe challenge the text or the author, and for very advanced learners, maybe even note things like bias or distortion. It might be difficult to imagine beginners getting to the stage of synthesis or evaluation, but we actually find that it can be done. With the right materials and guidance, even low-level English learners can get a little bit of experience developing all of these skills. That said, there are many barriers to developing reading skills, reasons why students might not enjoy reading or get stuck and uh, feel unable to progress. So what are those challenges? Common barriers include lack of foundational skills. So these have to do with the conventions of writing and how writing is organized. For example, in the United States, in English, we write from left to right. There are capitalized letters at the beginning of sentences and punctuation throughout sentences that help alter or clarify meaning. Uh, the text might be too difficult. Sometimes it's a fine line between something that's just challenging enough and something that might just be so over the heads of learners that they start to disconnect from trying to read and understand it. A lack of mental images might result from not having practiced imagining things in your mind that you're reading or seeing. Again, usually from lack of experience in formal education or just not enough experience reading in general. A lack of understanding of storytelling might also inhibit students. So the ways that stories are told with beginnings, middles, ends, characters, plot, conflict, these are universal concepts, but if what you're reading is a story that's arranged in a way that you can't understand or relate to because the storytelling method is just unfamiliar, that could really inhibit your comprehension. Poor fluency can very much uh, stand in the way of a student enjoying reading and developing skills. So when a student is struggling to understand each word in a vacuum instead of in the greater context of the sentence or the story, then they'll very likely get stuck in that phase. And finally, a lack of background knowledge. So if a student can't understand the concepts or context in a story because they have no experience or awareness of the subject matter, that will also be a heavy barrier to getting to any um, greater point of comprehension or enjoyment of a story. Let's talk about ways to build the key reading skills of comprehension and fluency, as well as ways to make students more active readers. Developing reading comprehension is an intentional, active, and interactive process. Reading comprehension can occur before, during, or after a person reads a particular piece of writing. And with the help of a tutor or teacher, here are some ways for a student to do that. First, a teacher or tutor can pre-teach new vocabulary. It's helpful to read material first before introducing it to your student and perhaps making a list of all the words that might come up that you foresee as being challenging for the student. By reviewing them first, the student will then recognize them with more ease in the context of the story. You can define them, you can draw them, you can explain them or discuss them. It's a universally effective way to build reading comprehension. You can also have discussions or do pre-reading activities to get familiar with key concepts. That goes along with the next point of making personal connections, finding out what a story is about and then connecting it to the life of your student, such as asking them if they've ever had a particular experience that might come up in the story, or even if they like or dislike certain things. A story about a man's dog might elicit a, um, a discussion of pets or animals in general, and so on. Ask questions throughout to check understanding. Take little breaks or pauses just to check in with students. What happened? Who is this person? Where are they? 
basic questions to keep them engaged and to build their comprehension before they feel like they've lost the thread of the story. You can preview readings, especially ones that are illustrated, by looking at pictures and talking about what you see. In that vein, you can also make predictions. What do you think will happen in the story? This is a really engaging way for students to develop a little bit of tension to see if their prediction comes true. And afterwards, practice summarizing. What happened? What was the story about? These words are highlighted here because they're teachable. Explaining that happened is something we use when we're talking about a story or an event or an experience, or using the word about in the context of stories or things that need explaining can be really great practice, even for beginners, to get in the habit of describing and summarizing what they've read. Here are some strategies for active reading. The reason active reading is important is that student engagement optimizes learning. The more a student feels involved in a story, the more likely they are to understand the meaning of what they're reading. So ask pre-reading questions. Ask students to visualize something that you read out loud by closing their eyes, telling you what they see or feel. Throughout reading, stop and ask your student to explain what has happened or just check in with their reactions as you go. My personal favorite way to actively read is to draw pictures or act out scenes from stories with students taking on the roles of different characters and bringing something on the page into a more physical, active, and kinesthetic place. You can teach story elements such as plot, setting, and character, and you can write a paragraph or several sentences in summary. Here are some strategies to build fluency. So again, fluency is the ability to read with speed, accuracy, and proper expression. The more fluent you are as a reader, the more you'll understand what you're reading because you're not pausing to labor over decoding or understanding every single word. You let the big picture of what you're reading sink in. When reading aloud, fluent readers always read in phrases and add intonation. They don't read choppily, one word at a time, but they look at how a sentence is written, maybe the punctuation or the context of the sentence, and they read it with appropriate tone and feeling. So how can you develop that in students? First, something we all understand as being important from the days when people read to us, you model, you read aloud for the students. Just as children learn about reading by being read to, you can read to adults and have them listen to the way that a fluent reader uses those phrases and intonation. You can practice difficult words before inserting them into the text. You might go over and repeat a word many times and finally insert it into a sentence, and you'll notice that a student can read it better. So also give students opportunities to hear text and then read it silently before they read it aloud. Doing that as part of a series, so reading aloud, reading silently, reading together, is a really tried and true method for developing reading fluency. You can choral read, or sometimes it's known as shadow reading, that's when you're reading together at the same time. And you might have a bit more of a dramatic or musical, or sometimes it's known as a sing-song pace, again, just to help teach and emphasize the intonation and phrases that are needed for fluency. Repeat stories. If you've read something once, you can read it again or maybe three times. By the time a student becomes familiar with the phrases and sentences in the story, they might get a little tired of it, but the more familiar they are, the more that means that they have developed a little bit more fluency, even if it's in the context of a single story. Poetry is a great teaching tool because of the natural ways it includes rhyming words, rhythm, and recitation. So feel free to incorporate poetry into your reading lessons. Here are some strategies we want to introduce you to some helpful resources that come in handy when teaching reading skills. One of the most effective resources we've encountered is a series called Easy True Stories, although there is a very easy True Stories volume for beginners, and it's a picture-based first reader by Sandra Heyer. 
In these books, newspaper articles that are true from around the country are adapted into illustrated stories, with each sentence being illustrated by a different picture. There are pre-reading activities, post-reading vocabulary activities and discussions, and a sort of emphasis on humor and fascination and human interest that really engages readers with high interest subject matter and encourages them to understand stories using many different tasks and repetitive activities. Here are some more tried and true excellent curriculum materials for teaching reading skills. Some of these are available for borrowing at LearningWorks, but local libraries and online booksellers also carry them. Easy Stories Plus, Talk of the Block, and What's Next are all what's known as multi-level readers. They start very easy and progress in difficulty through various volumes. They include reading comprehension activities such as questions, as well as phonics and vocabulary building to help students isolate and practice certain skills in the context of stories that are about interesting, relevant, adult-centric subject matter. A particular favorite is What's Next, which follows a young Somali woman as she navigates the difficulties and surprises of her new life in the United States. Next, in part five of the tutor training video series, we'll focus on assessment. In this part, you'll obtain a general understanding of assessment, and you'll also assess some student writing.